So um, thank you, Anna, Brent, and Felipe for your uh, wonderful presentations. And I think that you really dug into some of the con questions and concerns that were raised on, not concerns, but questions that were raised on the community panel in terms of really digging into um, some of the partnerships and some of the community engagement pieces. Um, I just wanted to start with, with one question to sort of extend that, that uh, lens. Um, the specific question that has sort of come about was like, how does one even go about starting this process? And you had mentioned that you know, Solarball was a part of the Urban Health Network, and it was really born out of that um, sort of community and that, those relationships. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, the network itself and maybe how, you know, you were able to build consensus to start the Solarball project specifically. Yeah, I can say something about that. Um, so the network um, is, is uh, started out as you know from a very small seed <laughs> of just a few people we sort of knew each other and we were all uh had a connection to latin america we're from there or and we're working in issues of urban health and so we you know convened uh, a small meeting here at drexel initially it was people who just knew each other and then you know we came up with a few goals and from the very beginning and I think this is, I think this is uh, perhaps um, heavily influenced by, uh, by Latin America, it, because from the very beginning, the policymaker engagement piece uh, was super important. So this was not viewed as a research network. It was viewed from the very beginning as something that was going to be engaged in policy. Um, and I think you know, and then this, you know, uh, uh, gradually the network started to grow and we incorporated all sorts of people who wanted to join us. And then we had this uh, wonderful opportunity to, you know, to uh, apply for this um, funding from the Wellcome Trust. And it was a perfect fit because they also wanted, um, you know, an international collaboration of this type that had policymaker engagement. But I think, I think another thing I want to highlight that I think has also really facilitated Salurval's ability to do this, these regional workshops with policymakers, we've done other policymaker engagement activities as well, is that, you know, many of the institutions in Latin America, and I think where Felipe is, and Marcia de los Andes is a very good example, they are very actively engaged in providing evidence for policy in a very direct way. Um, this happens also at INSP in Mexico, for example, Instituto Nacional de Salud Pública. So yeah, it's a research institute, but its, its main mission is to provide evidence that supports public policy. And so it's a very different mindset than what we sometimes have in the US, right? Where we're kind of in these academic places. Yeah, we're doing research, we're getting grants, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know, some of it will eventually trickle. And, you know, some people are more engaged than others, but it, but it's quite different, right? So I think that has made the sort of the whole dynamics of the study quite different um, and very interesting and challenging in new ways <laughs> too, but. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think it's just extraordinary because the, the, the Salar Ball Project and your urban health network really bridges across so many different countries, right? And so if you wanted to draw an analogy to the United States, you could say like, wow, you know, perhaps these different systems that are in place in these different countries with different stakeholders, maybe in some ways could be representative of, of people that are within individual metropolitan areas, you know, within the United States. So is, do you feel like, um, I mean, you mentioned that the network was sort of born organically and, and so that those are sort of the, the best ways for these kinds of partnerships to, to come about. Um, but are there any sort of uh, lessons that can be gleaned from from that sense of, of you know, it, could we apply something that's more, you know, applicable to the broad United States uh, by sort of engaging stakeholders in multiple metropolitan areas? Or do you think it's just too... Well, I, mean, to try I, think, that here. I think that would be very cool. I mean, there, you know, and we are, tr you know, trying to do some of that too, um, you know, with the Big Cities Health Coalition, for example, in the U.S. But um, I think, honestly, what, what really facilitated the work that we're doing in Salurval is, yeah, the, the network came together organically, but then we got funding. <laughs> and right, and we yeah. Got the funding from the Wellcome Trust, which, which was about creating this infrastructure, this platform for collaboration, right? And for evidence 
generation, policy relevant evidence generation. And so that was, that's what, that has been critical, critical. I mean, I think to, to bring this together. Um, and uh, so, and, you know, it's been tons, a lot of work as, uh, and, but, but, but a super interesting, the most, definitely the most interesting thing I've ever done by far. So. Yeah, it's really important public health work. I mean, you're doing it in such a way that a lot of people maybe perhaps like talk about or dream about, but you guys are really doing it. So it's very extraordinary. Um, I, I wanted to pivot and, and just turn to a broader area for discussion, um, which is which is how you all perhaps view the role that modeling can play in informing policy making, policy making, and conversely how policy making sort of hinders modeling. Um, you know, we've we've talked about this a bit, but you know how how in the in in light of COVID nineteen and how models have been used for you know policy decision making and, and and so forth or not right there's in the policy space you know in contrast to business or community um, they may be faced with a number of different evidence based pieces of information but then policy goes in a completely different direction so I was just wondering if you could comment um, any of you guys could comment on you know that that sort of um, disconnect or or tension, perhaps that may exist in policymaking, or or that doesn't, um, in contrast to business or community. Yeah, so I I think a point about COVID in particular. Obviously, there are a ton of COVID models, but I think that it is important to recognize that while you know the policy decisions aren't always you know, in lockstep with the evidence that are generated by these models, the models have been really influential in uh, helping us to understand really key aspects of the pandemic and how it evolves. Um, you know, so I think a lot of times people want to see like a really concrete causal arrow from a model to a policy, and that doesn't always happen. Um, but many times the models are generating really important insights that do sort of directly or indirectly influence policy. And then the other point that I think is really important about COVID and that we can take a lesson from in chronic disease or obesity research is that, that those models and the evidence that they generated, which were so critical, um, you know, particularly outside of the US context, but even in, in municipal decisions uh, in the US, those, were, those models were possible and the speed with which those models were developed were possible because of decades of, of research and infrastructure developing infectious disease models. And I think that's something that's really important in the chronic disease side is, is just sort of recognizing that we're, we have a long way to go to build up uh, modeling infrastructure that can really be responsive to policy needs, right? So I think that part of the work that we're doing uh, in developing the agent-based models and the group-based models is um, is generating evidence that's relevant for current policy decisions. But I think, like, to me, a lot of the, the benefit of this project is just developing a modeling infrastructure that will allow us to address more quickly future policy decisions. Um, so I, I think, to me, this is, you know, about sort of the long haul of where we want to go and focusing less on any particular model impacting any particular policy. Yeah, I think, Brent, you touch upon something that's sort of interesting in, in the sense that, and I believe this has come up on other, uh, on prior parts of this roundtable, but you mentioned the, 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 the fact that infectious disease modeling may be more sort of commonplace within the public health arena um, versus chronic disease modeling. And, and of course, I think that that is because there's this sort of friction between the, the political sort of um, time periods at which people are in office versus like chronic disease timelines and perhaps infectious diseases have a different timeline. And so that's, that's sort of inter that sort of like plays into that as well. Um, and, and the business side of it is also is also interesting in, in terms of how um, you know, Bruce has mentioned on several occasions the fact that in business school, you know, modeling is baked into the training programs for students, whereas with public health, um, to use your words, we have a long way to go in terms of sort of training up a workforce, not only to, to do the modeling itself, you know, to do the modeling, but also to utilize the modeling and to actually do the work to build up the partnerships. Um, 
So, um, so, so yeah, I don't know if you had any thoughts on, on ways that we can sort of help to develop those areas within the public health space or the education space or the training space amongst, you know, partners, not just within, you know, MPH programs, but, but sort of more broadly for the public health audience. Yeah. So Anna, I think can speak to this. She's sort of our uh, in-house visionary, but I think that, you know, part of it is just developing training programs. Like we have, uh, a summer institute at the Urban Health Collaborative at Drexel that every year offers a uh, systems thinking, um, you know, last, I think two years ago, actually we did a group model building, which is a short course that actually a lot of, um, it's mostly not academics. It's, it's people from NGOs and government organizations that want to use these tools. So I think that's part of it. Uh, incorporating it into curricula is real important. But I also think just like, you know, something that is really important. Anna mentioned, we got funded, right? And so a huge part of this is just making funding available um, and setting priorities such that different groups develop modeling infrastructure and capacity, right? Yeah. And I think even to extend that is, you know, within the funding infrastructure for there to be room for people to develop these partnerships, right? Like it takes time. It, it, you can't do like a multi-sector, multi-pronged intervention without having the time to sort of have the meetings and, and do sort of, you know, consensus building type activities to sort of get there, even if it's not formally group model building, but just conversations and, and meetings and symposia and, and just to sort of get on the same page with, um, you know, even if you have different end goal priorities to sort of get on the same page. Um, I guess to that, in, in that vein, Felipe, um, I, I really liked what you had, had mentioned and sort of brought in in terms of the, the civic, the civic and the community participation and the citizen science um, model that you incorporated into, into the, the Transme, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce it, the Transme Kabul um, project that you, that you mentioned. Um, is there, is there anything that you could, you could add, um, to sort of expand upon that, what that process looked like and, and, you know, how you went about engaging directly with the community members in that, in that project? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one lesson that we should learn from all this process and also from the COVID, et cetera, is that people should learn something at, at least a little bit about systems thinking. And all of these process have that component because when you invite policymakers to a group model building, they learn about system dynamics. When you invite the community to a citizen science exercise, they learn about technology, they learn about citizen science, and they understand that. So I think this makes very easy or easier at least to communicate models and policy, the communication between the, both things. So concerning the citizen science process, we usually you approach the community through a community leader or an agency or some uh, committee that they have. And after that, uh, what is important is to incorporate them and empower them as the researchers. So in that, for example, in the case of Transmicable, what we did was the group model building, but also we invited them to take pictures of the area and to do some walks. And with some app developed by Stanford, they started to observe the barriers and facilitator for their health. And they are the ones to report that to the policymakers through a presentation. And your role as a researcher is to train them to do that accurately and, and to provide the very useful insights for the policymakers. But what is more important at the end is that they make commitments and agreements with them. So what the community is going to do and what the, they expect the policymakers to do and to follow up on that. So this makes the process inclusive and systemic because all the actors are involved and, and generating the outcome which is shared, the purpose is shared by all of them. So that's the idea. And I think it's the same with, with, with the policymakers and COVID. If you invite them to model 
and not only to show them the model, so they will feel that they are also engaged in that. And I think this is one thing that happened. Policymakers here, at least in Colombia, now know about the SER model, a meta populations model, an agent based model. They know about that. I think that one year ago, they didn't know that exists at all. So that, that le common language is very important. Yeah, and I think that um, it also, you're so, sort of also highlighting the fact that, you know, system science and community-based participatory research, as as was highlight, highlighted by Leah Freerich, you know, in the prior roundtable was, was um, you know, they really go hand in hand. They're very complementary and they share a lot of the same processes and outcomes and, and benefits. And I think that citizen science model is really nice in the sense that you're really developing up, um, you know, for longer term sustainability, right? You don't want to, to, to go in like helicopter and helicopter out. You, you want it to be sort of a community owned process that they sort of really feel like they benefit from. That's great. Thank you. Um, we do have one question from the audience that is for Brent. I wanted to share with you. Um, the question is, why did you go from causal maps to agent-based models versus systems dynamics to simulate the impact of the intervention? Yeah, so it's a really good question. And I would just, uh, I guess, add a point of clarification that this isn't the only thing that we're doing. So we do have uh, a pretty sort of robust research infrastructure built up in Solarball now. And there are paper proposals going through that are going to be developing uh, system dynamics models uh, of obesity transitions in Latin American countries. And this builds off the work from uh, Felipe, Jose David, myself, who's another of our team members. Um, so we're not exclusively doing agent-based models, but I think that one of the reasons that we are is just sort of flexibility in the future questions that we address. So I'll talk specifically about the food model. Right now, we're just looking at uh, ultra-processed food consumption um, as an outcome, and it's not a spatially explicit model. But we know that access to different types of food is really important. So while we're building a model that's relevant to the current policies that are under consideration in Latin America, this really, the agent-based framework being so flexible will allow us to look at sort of human environment interactions and changes in the food environment. It allows us to look at uh, social networks and social influence, which are so important for the social inequities that we care about. Um, we're only looking at UPF consumption, but we could, I could see us moving in the future to a, a more sort of choice oriented framework where agents are choosing between ultra processed foods and other types of foods, um, you know, maybe based on the NOVA classification, right? Um, so I think just the flexibility and the ability to extend this model. And, and again, this just gets back to what I was talking about of, of sort of building infrastructure that we can then work from and have future policy impact. Um, so to me, that's, those are a couple of the major reasons. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful context. Um, I have another audience question for you guys. Um, I applaud the work, the persistence and depth of the relationships you are building. Sorry if I missed it, but are providers part of your stakeholders and has that included nurses, physicians, nutritionists? So, yes, uh, um, I'm not sure how many practicing physicians we've had in our stakeholder engagement activities. Uh, many of them are sort of public health physicians, but we do have nutritionists. Number of The nutrition, nutrition community is actually quite involved <laughs> uh, in a lot of our activities. Um, I'm not 100% sure that we've had nurses, but certainly we, you know, we, we do include the provider community as well. Um, and, uh, and I think that's the diversity of backgrounds is what made these group model building exercises so interesting. And I, I think one, one thing that I also want to highlight is that, uh, that I think the participants, I mean, what was very interesting is, um, you know, what the participants took from the workshops too, because then we got notes back saying, oh, I'm, I'm actually going to do this with my Ministry of Health team, you know, with this, on this other problem. So it, it really became these the the systems way of thinking these simple rules about causal loop diagrams became something that they could then use you know in other activities so that 
that was a really important byproduct of this whole activity. And, and this has a lot to do with this sort of changing the way in which we think about things, you know, thinking systemically. Um, and I think that is has been of incredible value and maybe, maybe more valuable than specific results we might get from the actual formal simulation models, I think, in the long run. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, okay, we have one more minute, but I have one more question for you, just quickly. Um, making the purpose shared an activity is inclusive is a strength. However, there can be loud voices or situations where people more knowledgeable about modeling or an agenda want to drive next steps. Has that happened? Is there a way to prevent that from happening with such a large and diverse group? And how do you handle that? Yeah, I, if, if I can give an answer. So, yeah, this always happens. So, but I think, I think that Peter Hoffman, with the with his training, he trained us to be facilitators in the workshops. And one thing that as a facilitator, you should have to take into account every moment is that point. So to to feel to give the the opportunity to talk to everyone, to have small interventions or short interventions, to split people into groups that are diverse. And that, that kind of methods help to, to do that. And also to have an iterative process with everyone is invited to provide feedback on everyone's ideas. And the, the idea of having a shared mental model, which is um, drawn into a causal loop diagram, helps a lot because everyone is discussing about that and not about the people that is there and their and their jobs or their particular situations. I don't know if Brent wants to add something to that. No, I think you covered it perfectly. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, thank you everyone in the audience for your thoughtful questions. And thank you, Anna, Brent, and Felipe for your wonderful discussion and for your presentation.